good evening. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Hope everyone has had a very productive um, day. We're going to go ahead and get started with uh, part three of this series on the seven churches of the book of Revelation. Um, let's pray. Our wise and eternal God, we do thank you for another day. Thank you, God, for your grace, for your mercy, for your goodness, for your loving kindness. Thank you for your favor. Thank you, God, for always looking out for us. Thank you for always being on our side. Thank you just for being who we are right now in Jesus' name that you would uh, be with us in the midst of this, this time of study and that you would enlighten us, illuminate your word to us that we'll see something, hear something, and gain something from this study that we did not know before. We pray, God, now that you would strengthen us and make us stronger. We pray, God, for blessings upon blessings upon blessings in accordance with the promise made in your word that we are blessed for hearing and for reading the words in this prophecy. So we pray now, God, that blessings come to each of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, over the past couple of weeks, we looked at the book of Revelation and we uh, started out talking about Revelation, just gaining a deeper understanding of what the book of Revelation is about. Um, and we definitely talked about how uh, the book of Revelation, unlike any other book, is a book of symbols. It's a book of mystery. It is a book, um, it's a literary work, but of course it's one that we cannot read literally. We cannot take it for literal value. We have to dig deeper and ask God and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us the spiritual meaning and the spiritual messages um, behind the text. Um, and so it behooves us to always enter study of the prayer. Um, and not on your own, not under your own pretenses, but um, entering and engaging deep prayer um, and asking God to reveal the meaning of the book to give us uh, insight by what we have um, learned and what we have gained from this text. Um, and not only that, but we found out that the book of Revelation, and we must note that it is the revelation, um, as some people always put an S at the end and say revelations. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ as uh, stated in chapter 1, verse 1. It is the revelation. It is the one revelation. There are not more than, um, there's not multiple revelations, if you will. Um, and it can't be called a book of revelation if there is nothing revealed to us. And so it's important, again, it is important for us to remember that we are reading the book and the whole purpose of finding out what the text is revealing to us um, and, and trying to be able to apply what it reveals to us. Even though it was written um, almost 2,000 years ago, um, there is still an applicable message in the text um, for us today. And as we've been looking at the seven churches, we've um, started looking at some of the symbols. Uh, the book of Revelation opens in chapter 1. Um, near the end of chapter 1, uh, Jesus already identifies himself. And verse 18 says, uh, do, well, verse 17, do not be afraid. I am the first and last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. All right. Uh, and so Jesus is letting us know this is his revelation to John the Apostle. So it is not John's revelation to Jesus for us. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ to John for us. All right. Um, and not only that, but we have to remember uh, that in the text, it talks, in, it, it clearly states that this is a revelation written to, uh, says in verse 20 of chapter one, the mystery of the seven stars when the golden lamp stands. Um, this revelation was written to the seven churches which were in um, in Asia. In Asia, um, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. That's in verse chapter one, verse verse four. The letter was written to the seven churches that are found in Asia. And as we've also discussed um, on the first night, we really looked at 
geography, geographically where um, Asia Minor was um, at that time and what it is now. It was Asia then, but now the area that we're talking about where these seven churches are located is now the current country called Turkey. Um, and we all know about Turkey. Turkey is a country in great turmoil, great unrest, uh, great terroristic um, activity, um, the home of ISIS um, or ISIL, whichever way you prefer to call it. Um, and so we're talking about modern day Turkey. And I think if we understand um, the history of the book of Revelation and the area called Asia at that time, it, it, it may give us some insight into why the people in Turkey now, in modern day Turkey, are acting the way that they do, why there's so much unrest, why there's so much hatred toward Christians and all these other things, why all of that is going on now. Well, if we look at the book of Revelation and understand the revelation that was told, it would help us to understand more about what is going on in modern day Turkey right now. And so as my grandmother would always say, there's nothing new under the sun, just new ways of doing things. And so the Bible, even as old as the literary work is, it is still relevant, still applicable. And if we read it right, we can see how the Bible, even though it was talking then specifically to the people of that particular time, we can see how it has very great um, and detailed contextual meaning and purpose for us in this present day and time. And so as we move forward with tonight, um, I really want to look at the seven churches. There's a couple things I want us to be mindful of when we're talking about these seven churches. Um, one, let's find some common themes or common statements um, that are in the seven churches. Uh, through chapter 3. All right, chapter 2 and chapter 3 contain the uh, directives for the seven churches. And in there we find uh, commonalities among all seven of the churches. One, one statement at it that is repeated for all seven of the churches uh, is the statement, I know your works. Whenever the message or the revelation is being given to the seven churches, Jesus first, all right, so we can see that in chapter 2, verse 2, verse 9, verse 13, verse 19, and then chapter 3, verse 1, 8, and verse 15. He says, I know your works. The message clearly to us is simply this, that regardless of who we are, where we are, whoever we are, or whoever we think we are, the Lord knows us for our works. Um, and I love what James says, and it's great to tie uh, one book into another book. James says, faith without works is dead. And here Jesus is saying to the seven churches, I know your works. I know what you have done. I know what you've been going through. I know all of the details of your experience in, in Christendom. I know what you've been through. And so we have to realize that the Lord does know what our works are. I don't care how uh, deep we think we are, how wonderful we think we are, um, how tricky we think we are. But we cannot fool God. We cannot hide from God. What really happens is the Lord already knows us for our works, the good works, the bad works. You name it, he already knows. All right, let me back up real quickly. Uh, in chapter one, at the end of chapter one, there uh, we also talked about uh, the, the meaning of the number seven and how seven is a divine number indicating uh, divine perfection or divine completion. So we have seven churches, all right? In Revelation chapter 1, it talks about the seven churches. It says there are seven stars and seven golden uh, lampstands. The seven stars, it says, are the seven angels, represent the angels of the, each of the seven churches. Well, the seven stars or the angels, not necessarily the angels, but think how we do in this present day when you go to someone's church. What is the what we say? What is it that we say when we greet the pastor? We say to the all right. And so, John, this message, this revelation was coming to the leaders of the seven churches, not necessarily spiritual angels. But this angel that is in this text, the word here in Greek all means messenger. So the letter is being written to the messenger or to the leader, the preacher or the pastor of these seven churches. He's given a directive, given information, giving revelation to the leadership 
of these seven churches. Isn't it great that God still speaks to leaders? It's the only problem is some of our leaders just don't want to listen to what God has to say now. But the Lord knows us for our works. And we have to be mindful that God knows us for our works. He knows our labors. He knows our struggles. He knows our ups. He knows our downs. The Lord knows us for our works. And so here's a message to the seven churches, to the seven pastors. So the seven stars represent the seven messengers or the seven leaders of the seven churches. The seven golden lampstands, the golden lampstands represent the seven churches themselves. All right. And so the message is going to the leader, but not just to the leader. The Lord is speaking to the ecclesia. The, the body or the gathering of those of like mind, those who share in common thought, those who share in one faith, who share in one hope. So the Lord is not revealing his message or his word or direction to just the pastor or just the leadership. No, the Lord is speaking to the whole body of believers, to the aggregation of believers, to the ecclesia, to the church. Remember, the church is not the building where we worship. All right. This is just a building. The church is not the building. The church is the gathering of people, the people that come together to serve, who share in hope, who share in faith. That is the ecclesia and that is. All right. And so as we go from there, we've talked about how one common thread amongst all seven churches is the fact that the Lord opens each revelation to each of the churches with, I know you. That's the first thing. Second commonality is as you get to the end of each of these messages, each of these seven revelations, if you will, uh, he also states that the message is to who, he who overcomes. All right. And so there is a blessing that is extended to the one who overcomes. Uh, once the Lord has identified a situation or identified the problem or revealed to that pastor what their struggle has been, what their experience has been like. He says, he who overcomes. There is a blessing given to the ones that overcome. In other words, to the ones that heed the message, heed the warning, heed the word of correction that, that, uh, that the Lord delivers to that body of believers and they overcome. In other words, they are successful. They take heed of what the Lord says and then they make the necessary change to improve or do what needs to be done to better, their, better the church and to better all the lives of those who are part of the ecclesia. All right. So that's the second thing. So first, the Lord knows us for our works. Second, he blesses those who overcome. The third thing that comes up in all three, all seven of the uh, revelations to one, to each of the seven churches is he states this. At the end of each one of the proclamations, it states, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit has to say to the church. What a great benediction. He that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit has to say to the church. He that has an ear. In other words, if you have not only the intuition, but you have the inclination to hear and to listen and to overcome, God blesses those who overcome, who hear, let them hear what the spirit, not what man, not what John is saying. And so we have to be mindful. I know sometimes it's easy to say, oh, the pastor's just talking about what he wants to talk about. Sometimes we have to believe that the pastor um, is, is hearing from God. And the example that we have in this text is as the Lord reveals to the messenger or the angel of the house, the Lord also reveals to the body of the house, the ecclesia of the house. And so, yes, the Lord will reveal to the messenger, but there's also some revelation that comes to the ecclesia. And so if you have an ear to hear what the spirit has to say to the church, what the spirit has to say to the body, what the spirit not the man, not the woman, but what the spirit is saying to us. And I think it really pushes us um, as the modern church. I think it's easy for us to look at our pastors, at our leaders and say, you know, our own declaration. You know how we do uh, of whether they're really being spirit led or not. You know, th that's fair game. Uh, but the Bible also says we have to learn how to try the spirit by the spirit. All right. 
And so it's easy to point fingers at a pastor, point fingers at our leaders and say they're not what they're not doing. But sometimes we have to ask God to give us an ear that is really trying to tell us. Uh, Lord, give us ears to hear what you're trying to tell us. Give us ears to hear what you're trying to speak to and help us as the body of believers to understand and accept the message that is coming to this house, to this gathering of believers. And so pastors are very peculiar people. Leaders are very peculiar people. First to admit, I know I'm a very peculiar person. Sometimes people will agree with a decision I make. Sometimes they will not. Sometimes they will accept it. But the real truth is we have to, if we're following under someone's leadership, if you made it up in your mind that you're going to be a part of someone's have already signed on that you believe, for one, that this person is spirit led. That's first thing. You signed on and said, I believe that this person is your spirit led. That means I also have to believe that as you move forward, you're moving under the unction of the Holy Spirit, that the spirit is leading. The spirit leads and guides the messenger or the angel of the house. It is our duty and our responsibility as members of the congregation to also follow the leadership that is ahead of us. All right. Because if you don't understand what the pastor or the leader is trying to do, as the laity, we have a responsibility. As laity, you have a responsibility. No, it's not just up to the pastor. No, it's not up just to the preachers. But as laity, we have an equal responsibility. As the laity of the house is to pray and ask God to do what? Give you an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Because as I believe, I wholeheartedly believe, as this example is here, as God speaks to the head of the body, God will all rest of the body, and it is our responsibility to fall in line where our gifts are and fall in line where our respective places of God is leading the head and leading the body so that we're all on one accord. It does not help for us to be here with one agenda and the members in five or ten other agendas. No, there can only be one agenda for the house. One agenda for the house. And as the Spirit of God reveals that agenda, follow God's leadership, follow the messenger of the house, and follow the leading of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of God reveals to the house what we're supposed to be doing. All right? Third thing, so we have the Lord said, I know your works. There's a blessing to those that overcome. Third says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit is saying to the church. Those are three things that, we, that are common in uh, all th seven of these proclamations. Another thing I want to bring up, and I know this is a um, very touchy, uh, touchy, touchy topic. But in two of, I believe in two of the, the proclamations, one uh, to the church of Pergamos and one to the church of Thyatira, um, there, the statement is used uh, or reference is made to sexual immorality or committing sexual immorality. And yes, I have to go there. I, I, I have to go there because we need some clarity in the church about what the Bible is really saying about sexual immorality. And I know this may disrupt some folks' uh, Jesus. Uh, it may upset some folks' Jesus or upset some folks' faith or make them log off. That's fine. But the truth needs to be told. Um, and so when the Bible is talking about sexual immorality in the New Testament um, and the word in Greek that is used does not mean what common church or a common doctrine, let me put it that way, um, has made it to say. We like to use this text or these texts, refer to these texts that use uh, the phrase sexual immorality to own or limit it to homosexuality. And so um, we have those in leadership all around the world, especially in mainline churches and all other kind of churches and cults and practices um, and this is probably why I make other folks mad because I'm not a follower. Um, but I, the Bible says study to show yourself approved, a workman who 
uh, rightly divides the word of truth. And my prayer has always been, God help me to rightly or correctly divide the word of truth uh, and, and gain some understanding from what I'm reading. Morality that is mentioned in the Bible in the New Testament is not referring to homosexuality as some folks like to presume. Uh, I think for some people it is just easier um, to limit it there because then it doesn't make them have to deal with their issues. Uh, it's easier to just limit it to what makes us uncomfortable as individuals rather than wrestling and dealing with the real truth of the matter. And the real truth of the matter is um, the Bible is not talking just about uh, homosexuality. No, actually in the Greek, the word that is used there, uh, it's spelled P-O-R-N-E-U-O. Uh, the word, and from that we derive the word obviously pornography. Um, but it is actually referring to anything that was not in alignment with the Mosaic laws. Any practice that was not in alignment with uh, the Mosaic laws were considered uh, immoral. All right. It was considered immoral. So we're not just talking about homosexuality. We are talking about a list of things. For example, uh, the word literally means more than homosexuality. It actually means it, or includes incest. Uh, when you're having sexual relations with persons who are too closely related to you. Also refers to um, having sex. And, and this is probably why, why some people uh, want to steer clear of it and want to limit it to just homosexuality because <clears throat> the last part of the definition for a uh, pornio um, really hits home. With the definition says that sexual immorality also included having sexual relations with persons who men and women who are divorced because the law said if somebody was divorced, you weren't supposed to have sex with them. If it's your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, not supposed to have sex with them. And so the word there is talking about immoral practices or anything that is not the Mosaic laws. OK, and so when they're saying sexual immorality and some people want to say, oh, no, it's just talking about homosexuality. No, engaging in some practices with folks that's related to you. It's talking about those of you who think because sister so-and-so's husband left her fair game. No. According to the definition of the term, sexual immorality referred to uh, those that were on the divorcees list. So just because somebody was divorced did not or did not give you a right or give you the freedom to have sexual relations with them. So that might be the reason why in my, uh, I guess, intuitiveness in my, in my thinking, that's probably one of the reasons why some people like to limit uh, sexual immorality to just homosexuality because that may be the one thing that they don't do hear me now uh, but they have no problem messing with sister so and so or the pastor and his wife have been divorced and now I find it my business uh, as one of the uh, uh, to sit on the front row and be overly flirtatious uh, with the pastor uh, uh, we've all seen it we've seen it because it wasn't homosexuality, so we excused it. But according to the text, sexual immorality included not only that, but the third thing that it also included was uh, engaging in idolatry. Okay. Also refers to um, engaging in idolatry, um, eating uh, of, of the left to uh, foreign gods, and just engaging in all kind of idol practices was considered immorality and the same referred to all immorality so we have to be careful uh, when we're reading the uh, the bible because uh, we, we have uh, five or ten different ways to uh, depict something uh, but in ancient greek or in languages were not as complex the people did not have so many options 
uh, in terms. And so this one word covered a multitude of things and issues. And so when you go to places and the people want to say referring to homosexuality, you, sh you have a right to challenge them and tell them, please define what it really means. Look up the word and see what the word or to sexual immorality as it's translated. Um, uh, it just did not include uh, homosexual practices. All right. Itself, when we start talking about the homosexual thing um, and all that other stuff, we have to realize why those laws were put in place in the with um, because anything that God made, God said it was good. And so God made all things. God made the good and the bad, the sun to shine on the just I signed off on it. If God did not approve of homosexuals, in my thinking, God has enough power um, that if it was in God's will to destroy, it, God could. However, since the practice continue, God knows God knows it the text says I know you for your works all right I know you for your works and so there are some of us who are so easy to point fingers at somebody else's situation but we forget uh, the things that we're doing personally uh, that may be worse than somebody else's situation we're doing things that are worse than what somebody else near us is doing but it's easier to point our finger at someone else and say they're the bad one. I'm okay, but they are worse than I am. All right. And so we have to be very careful about how we point fingers. The next thing I want to share with you from the book of Revelation, um, I'm big on looking at the meaning of words. And when we look at the meaning of the cities, the name where these seven churches um, were arranged, you had Ephesus. The church of Smyrna, the church of Pergamon, the church of Sardis, the church of Philadelphia, and the church of Laodiceans. All right. And so the meaning, I, I, I'm big on word studies, big on word studies. And so I'm just going to give you a little bit on word study. I really believe the particular names of those seven cities uh, was really giving us indication of how God is Autophacy is a complete revelation. And so God is approaching the complete church, the whole church, the perfected church. And he's at plague the church as a whole. All right. Because when we look at the meaning of the names of the cities, the meaning of the names of the cities uh, really gives us seven different characters, seven different characteristics of church and church people and those of us in the church. All right. Gives us seven different characteristics uh, that affect all of us in the church. And here God has a message to all of us. So first we have the church of Ephesus. Ephesus meaning permitted. All right. So we have the church that was permitted. Second, Smyrna refers uh, is derived from the same word for the herb myrrh. Um, and the word, so we have the Lord sending a message to the church that's been permitted because all of us have been permitted to enter. It's not because we've been so good, not because we've been so perfect. It's not because of our blood on the cross. No, it was because of the blood of Jesus Christ that we've been allowed or permitted to do what we do. But he also has a message to those of us that have an experience of bitterness because some of us hold on to some bitterness from things that have just been bitter. We're bitter with ourselves. We're bitter with the persons that wounded us. We're bitter with the pastor. We're bitter with the church members sitting to our left and right. We're best bitter. And so the Lord is sending a message to the bitterness. The third, Pergamos. Pergamos really means height or elevation. And so those of us who have elevated ways of thinking, we have our, our ways of thinking are higher or we think they're higher than grandeur. We have those thoughts and uh, that mentality that we're better than. And so the Lord is sending a message to the church, to those churches that have that mothers. We're better than they are. We're a part of this movement. We're a part of that movement. So we're better than. So he sends a message to the dated or promoted above other people. The fourth church, church of Thyatira. Thyatira really means afflicted. Wow. The odor of affliction. 
literally the word is translated as odor of affliction, the smell. And so the smell or the aroma of affliction plagues the church because we've been afflicted with so many conditions and issues to those of us that are in that situation. We've been afflicted. Uh, how many of us have some church hurt? Uh, not only are we bitter, but we've been afflicted. We've been afflicted with some uh, bad teaching. We've been afflicted with some hatred. We've been afflicted with some, with some stuff and we've been carrying that stuff all of our days and all of our lives. But the Lord has a word for us to him or her that overcomes to the one that rises above and gets out of this state of affliction. A letter to the church of Sardis, the church of Sardis, meaning the prince of joy, written to the joyful church church that's just happy about serving the Lord, the, the gathering, the people who are just and doing it God's way, the people who are just joyful about serving God. All right. So that's another part of the church, because there are some of us that are, I was just glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And so we have a joyful church. We have those who are just glad to be in God's service. All right. The sixth characteristic that we find is the church of Philadelphia, uh, which is very uh, from the Delaware Valley. Church of Philadelphia, Philadelphia meaning brotherly love. This is the loving church, that church that just loves people, the church that just deposits love on people just for who they are, who understand what the Lord was saying in Exodus 15, uh, verse 13, in your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed in your strength. You will guide them to your holy temple. We have to be a loving church. And so the Lord has a message not only to the bitter church, to the afflicted church, to the high-minded church, uh, not only to the permitted church but the Lord, and the joyful church, but he has a message to the loving church, to those churches that maintain unconditional love for all people, that brotherly love. We just love people. We love to help. We love to serve. We love to be a message for the loving church. And he that overcomes shall get a blessing and get a reward from the Lord. All right. And the seventh character we find is the church of Laodicean. Or which means justice of the people. So here we have the just church. Be loving, but the church ought to be just. Uh, and just means we ought to do right. Uh, we have to do right by all people and not just some people. And I think some of us have just found it easier to do it, uh, do things uh, the easy way because it's easy for us. But God is calling for a just church, a just ga gathering of people, a just aggregation of believers, people who are going to serve God and serve God's people in a just way, meaning we're going to. All right. So there's no big eyes, no little use, no, uh, no, no important folks and unimportant folks. No, we're all part of the same part of this one aggregation, this one ecclesia. We are part of this gathering of believers, this gathering of one hope sharing just in our sharing and our delivery of God's gospel message. So we have seven characteristics. One, we're permitted. Two, the bitter church. Three, the elevated or high-minded church. The afflicted church. The joyful church. The loving church. Beloved, we have work to do. And so I was wondering why is there a, a message to these seven churches? These seven characteristics really sum up the church universal. They sum up our church experience, the, the experience of faith. Uh, because all of us have at one part of these predicaments and have found ourselves in situations just like this. We can all look around and find churches that fit in one of them. has a message to us. I know your works. The good works. The bad works. The nights. The not loving works. The joyful works. The just works. I know your afflictions. I know your bitterness. I had to go through to get here, and yet I still blessed you to get where you are and to have what you have. And so God sends him. And so God sums up his message to the church as a whole in these seven churches. Uh, the message is very clear. 
that as we move forward as the body of Christ in this modern age, in this contemporary age, it is important for us to remember and to reflect upon where we are. Not necessarily the name on the sign outside of your building, but where we are as individuals and as a body of believers. Have we been so afflicted <clears throat> of, our, of our purpose and our and our, our, our place in the body of Christ? Have we become so bitter? <clears throat> have we become so our bitterness and our anger and our frustration that we have forgotten how to be loving, how to be just, how to be joyful? Have we forgotten all of these things? Because there's balance. If you notice in these seven churches, there is balance. There is great balance in the seven churches because we have the permitted church. We have the bitter church, the elevated or high minded folks, the afflicted folks and the just. But at the heart of it all, the first church sums it all up. Regardless of our situation, all of us have been permitted to be where we are. We have been permitted to be a part of the body of Christ. God has given us permission and enabled us and allowed us the right to be of God. So regardless of where we come from, what we've done, or what the what that we are, who we are is the, is the sons and daughters of God, and we must be mindful of that. And as leaders of the church and as the message, of, it is incumbent upon us as the messengers or the angels of the house that we spread the message as the Lord would have it and not single folks out. Amen. Because just like we can single somebody else out, I think that's why we find so many preachers now that are being exposed. Because we spent so many years and so many sermons bashing and ridiculing and, and, and uh, knocking, on, uh, knocking everybody else down about their stuff that we tried to mask it and hide behind our own stuff. And so now we're in a season now where our own ugliness as the messengers or the angels of the house of God, we are being exposed. But there's a message. I know you for your works. If you overcome your obstacles or your circle. And third, if you don't understand what to do or how to do it, pray. He that has an ear, she that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit of the Lord is saying to the gathering of the believers. God is saying there's work for us to do, but we can't get it by get it done by being divided. No, we can only get it done by being united for one cause in a perfect work, in a perfect cause, sharing in a perfect faith, serving a perfect God. Seven churches. Perfect message is perfected and complete to the church. It's covered us all bases. And so please be mindful as you go forward by the misinterpretation of the Bible. Um, and if you have any further questions, you can call me and I'd be glad to share with you. I know some people have an issue, but I'll take you to the Greek and show you what it means um, because I didn't make it up. It's in there. And so we have to be mindful when we're reading the text, what the text says and what does the text mean? The text says one thing, but we have to ask God, ask the spirit what the what does the text really mean for us in this day? All right. <clears throat> of course, uh, we, there were some historical reasons why the letters were written. But now we have to take it as our challenge to take what was written then 2000 years ago and apply it to us now. That's the only way we can continue to give the Bible relevance for our present day. If we can make people understand how it applies to where we are in this present day age. So I thank you and I appreciate you. Love you. God bless you.